This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. And Heidi, i got to say, ahead of the open here for trade in Seoul and Tokyo today, I think what's really standing out to me is just this inflation data that came out in the last half hour or so and that, that beat that we had on what analysts or economists, rather, have been expecting hotter than, than, than what the, the, the readings have suggested. Yeah, and in fact, you know, how does that sit then with uh, the recession data that we had recently as well, right? And how does that mm. fit in with how the Bank of Japan might be thinking about their timing from exiting uh, their rate structure? One of the drivers, of course, for this big Japan stock rally. Yeah, and I think something that really as well just backs those hike bets. Uh, uh, we have seen a lot of economists, as they say, sort of predicting that we could see something as soon as April of this year. But that question of whether we're going to see any sort of exit away from negative rates. Uh, the Japanese yen there, you're seeing it just a little bit firmer against the greenback, but still you're holding above that 150 mark. Uh, equities wise... Again, not really seeing too much movement. Maybe that's also why Japan is standing out to me so much this morning is because we don't have too much going on for markets elsewhere today. But uh, still, it is uh, that, that, that inflation print and, and, and what, as we said, it means for the BOJ, whether it makes it any easier for them to shift their policy settings. We actually are getting some lines coming out as well uh, from the finance chief in Tokyo or Japan, Suzuki, and he's saying that he wants to take a look at those numbers quite closely. That's the finance minister there, Suzuki, speaking just a little bit earlier today. So that's the outlook for Japan. As I said, not really too much movement here. Again, when you take a look at what we've got in Korea today, uh, how those shares are performing so far in the session is looking very, very range-bound so far. So we had the U.S., one overnight. Uh, we didn't get, again, too much movement, but it was a little bit weaker here. Uh, really, the, the economy is back to the forefront. That's what the numbers are sort of suggesting, too, is what we're seeing in, in, in pricing so far. We've got that favoured inflation gauge for the Fed. Those numbers are due up or due earlier this week and could really highlight what's likely to be a bit of a bumpy path to achieving the 2% target. So I guess, yeah, wait and see. We can check on the trading volumes as well through the hour, Heidi. Yeah, take a look at uh, what we're watching here in Australia, Bell. And in terms of the broader market, a bit of downside, about half a percent. We're seeing uh, a lot of the stocks that are slipping are concentrated across mining, uh, real estate shares as well, dragging the index uh, mostly. That drop that we see in the early sort of first hour of trading really reflecting that renewed caution from the markets more broadly after we had U.S. shares losing steam near those record highs. Really a lot to look out for in terms of uh, a data-heavy week out of the U.S. as well as a Fed's big heavy week as well, right, in terms of how much more commentary we'll get and, and, and how that's been building the case for caution and rates potentially staying longer, uh, higher for longer, I should say. Uh, the Aussie dollar is holding pretty steady at 65.39. Remember, we had that uh, decline finally when it comes to the US dollar uh, in the previous week after weeks of gains and that sort of uh, US exceptionalism story to some extent is really still sticking when it comes to the US dollar. Watching uh, crude as well at the moment, 77.65 is where we're trading when it comes to New York traded crude. We're seeing sort of pockets of strength across physical markets boosting uh, some sentiment. The, uh, the wider sentiment though remains pretty range bound as well. Goldman and Bank of America both continuing to predict that range bound tight range when it comes to crude prices but the Lunar New Year uh, kind of demand out of China was a boost and we're seeing some more buying activity across refineries in the US as well. A quick look at Treasuries. It is a big week uh, ahead for this market. Ten year yields rising a bit uh, in the overnight session. We saw the Australian equivalent uh, following in the early part of Tuesday as well but uh, traders keeping a close eye on how that market is going to sort of take in uh, what is expected to be heavy treasury and corporate sales amid the month-end positioning. Uh, we did have the, uh, the, the auctions on Monday of two- and five-year government notes as well. Let's bring our next guest who remains positive on Japan as their preferred non-US market. With us now is Kieran Calder, head of Asia Equity Research at UVVP. And, you know, it's interesting that we see a pretty immediate reaction from policymakers in terms of, you know, wanting to, to, to gauge what we see from that CPI reading that came in really hotter than almost every analyst had expected. We're hearing from the Japanese finance minister speaking in Tokyo. How big a component is this, what the BOJ potentially does next to what we see with this equity rally. 
Yeah, so um, so for us, you know, as you mentioned, so we like we like Japan, and we think part of the story is that is the. Uh, Changing interest rate uh, environment. So, whereas the soft uh, GDP print kind of took the pressure off the, the BOJ, um, numbers like the CPI number probably put the pressure back on on the BOJ. So, I mean, o overall, uh, we we think that uh, we probably are moving to an end of uh, of uh, negative interest rates uh, in Japan, but um, it, it's just a matter of time. Um, and maybe even in, in, in between then and now, um, it's the spread between the, the tens and, and, and the short-term rates, um, which is positive for sectors such as such as banks uh, in Japan, which uh, are able to benefit from from that spread. So, you know, the interest rate environment is, is changing, and we think it's just a matter matter of time, and that's part of the positive story in uh, in Japan. And in fact, when you take a look at uh, where market expectations are falling on when the BOJ will finally move, uh, if you take a look at this chart, that first liftoff might happen as soon as March. And how much, I suppose, do you think the market on the, on the macro front has already kind of prepped for this? Because uh, the, the, the other big sort of narrative for Japan is really the big kind of governance hopes for Japanese uh, companies, right? Yeah, so I mean, there's there's a few uh, levers that are uh, working in Japan. Um, the two that you mentioned, as well as corporate earnings, are are continue to grow to uh, to new highs. Um, so I mean, I think you know the market has uh, been talking about the end of uh, negative interest rates for, for quite a while. But I mean, the, I think it's one of the last things the BOJ wants to do. So um, it, it's. Uh, you know, it'll it'll happen when it happens. On the on the corporate governance side, um, you know, certainly this has been uh, uh, as a backdrop uh, pretty pretty positive. So you know, they've um, published uh, they're, they're publishing a monthly list now. The, the stock exchange is of companies that are uh, uh, cooperating with the, the guidance that they issued just over a year ago. Um, and I think it's interesting that it, with the second print of that, which came in the middle of this month. Um, you know, it, it's of course two two data points doesn't doesn't make a trend, but um, the uh, the list the names on the list are now underperforming uh, the topic so far this year, whereas uh, the names that appeared on the first list uh, in January ha had outperformed during during the course of the year. So you know, it's uh, it's something in the background, but at the end it, it comes to uh, uh, you know company specifics around um, what what managements are doing to grow earnings. We're starting to hear at least some uh, investors turn perhaps a little bit more positive on Chinese equities, and we have seen it again reflected, I guess, in the performance of, of shares there, even though the rally has taken a bit of a, a breather somewhat of late. But, Kieran, are you changing your sort of pessimism toward that market at all? So, so, I mean, we started the year, you know, negative on, on China. I think we've become, over the last eight weeks, a little more negative on, on China. Um, but, I, you know, from a longer-term perspective, it always makes uh, sense to pay attention to outliers, and certainly China uh, has been an outlier. Um, you know, the market is cheap. It's for a reason. There's a, uh, multiple self-inflicted policies that have, have taken us to where we are now. Um, but against that, you know, you only need a little bit of uh, a little bit of good news to to uh, move, possibly move move share prices. So, we think though, uh, ultimately, you will need a, a, a concrete resolution to the problems in in the property property market, to um, uh, you know, be as as a precursor to be able to uh, regain the confidence of of long term foreign investment. Uh, in China, so at the moment, um, you know, there's there's a trade going on, and, and that makes sense. Um, but for the return of long-term uh, investors, uh, we think that we're not there yet. And I guess uh, to your point, I can see in your notes here, India kind of stands out as an alternative investment destination instead. Yeah, so I mean, uh, so not just for us. I think that you know, obviously, that's uh, w w where the market is, and you know, uh, the best performing large markets so far this year have, have been the U.S., Japan, and India. Um, India, um, you know, it's, uh, market access can sometimes be a problem. Um, valuation is is not cheap, um, but it's a, a market that you know we become increasingly interested in um, to add, especially on on any any sort of weakness if we do get that. Here. And one of the maybe the surprises so far this year has been the, the turnaround we've seen in Korea stocks. So much of that story seems like a familiar reframe that we're seeing play out in Japan. Do you see opportunities? 
Yeah, I mean, they're, def they're definitely trying to uh, uh, replicate at some level, you know, what Japan has been successfully able to do over the last year in terms of becoming the corporate governance uh, market, uh, you know, re recognized globally. Um, I, I think, you know, the initial uh, uh, publication or, or is very light on details. Um, ultimately, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, of strong, especially tech-related names uh, based in Korea. Um, if if the target of the uh, uh, you know value up program in in Korea is to eliminate the uh, Korea discount um, versus other regional stock markets, then maybe that's a good place to start. Um, but again, we we need to uh, you know if you compare what to what the stock exchange in Japan has done with so much detail um, and uh, continuous updates. Um, you know, Korea's got a, a, a you know, a, a, they're not there yet, that's for sure. They've got to, um, get, you know, fill out the program, I, I would say. All right, Kieran, thanks very much for your time. That was Kieran Calder there, head of Asia Equity Research at UBP. And let's uh, take a look at some of the movers we're tracking because we're just bang on 10 minutes into the session so far. And uh, what we're taking a look at first it relates to crypto stocks because overnight there was that big story, Bitcoin trading above 54,000. That takes us back to a two-year high. And so something that uh, investors... At a liking, obviously, but it, it really does come down to uh, people that are moving into those Bitcoin ETFs, and that's just spurring quite a lot of optimism in the sector. What else we're tracking is the steel makers or Nippon Steel in particular here because it is that question mark over whether Nippon Steel uh, will be able to proceed with a planned $14.1 billion takeover of United States Steel Corp. We do understand that Nippon Steel and the United Steel Workers have signed an NDA. And so that allows essentially talks to progress even though the union publicly maintains its opposition to that planned takeover, but you are seeing Nippon still here, just moving a, a little bit higher so far. Woodside, the other name that we're tracking here, we've got uh, that stock already an hour into trade, but we have seen it, again, holding in positive territory, not a significant move up. We did see profits sliding on lower prices, uh, but still we had output at a record here and that's what investors are really liking the sound of. We also want to get more details really on uh, what they see in terms of deals because that's another big focus of the earnings here after those talks with uh, Santos, a smaller Australian rival, collapsed last month of a potential tie-up. But we're going to be getting uh, a big interview. Actually, Heidi's doing this one later today, speaking to the Woodside Energy CEO and Managing Director, Meg O'Neill. That's about the earnings and the outlook at 2 p.m. Sydney time, 11 a.m. if you're watching in Hong Kong, Heidi. Yeah, and coming up, uh, the CEO of the Hong Kong-based utility, CLP, will be joining us to discuss their full-year net income miss and the outlook when it comes to their businesses across Asia, also here in Australia. But first, the White House once again presses Republicans to unlock assistance to Ukraine as Russia's wartime economy shows resilience. We'll get the details next. This is Bloomberg. Some of the top geopolitical stories that we're following this hour. U.S. President Joe Biden is hoping that negotiators can secure a temporary ceasefire between Israel and Hamas soon. Discussions on a pause in fighting in exchange for the release of more hostages taken by Hamas have intensified in recent days, with Biden saying a ceasefire could come as soon as next Monday. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan earlier said representatives from Israel, the U.S., Egypt and Qatar meeting in Paris had signed an agreement on the broad contours of a hostage deal. The Palestinian Authority's Prime Minister Mohammed Shtaya has attended his government's resignation. The official Palestinian newswire says PA President Mahmoud Abbas had asked the government to stay on as caretaker until a new administration had formed. The US and Arab countries in the region have pushed for reformed Palestinian authority since the Israel-Hamas war broke out in October. 
Iran has reduced its stockpile of near-bomb-grade uranium over the past three months, easing some fears of a wider Middle East conflict. Nuclear inspectors from the UN watchdog say Tehran's holdings have dropped 5% since November, but that still means Iran has the technical knowledge and material to fuel several nuclear weapons within weeks. Ukraine says the European Union has only delivered about a third of the artillery ammunition the bloc pledged for the country. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen told reporters on Sunday that the bloc had already delivered more than half of a million rounds. As the war against Russia grinds into its third year, Kyiv is looking for weapons as a lifeline as a US military aid package remains stuck in Congress. China wants Australia to actively support its efforts to join the CPTPP trade bloc. The two nations' trade ministers have met on the sidelines of the World Trade Organization conference in Abu Dhabi. Bloomberg's Paul Allen joins us now. And Paul, how much closer is China to joining the bloc and what does it want from Australia? Well, the ball is incrementally further down the field. Uh, this meeting between Don Farrell, the Australian trade minister, and Wang Wangtao, uh, the Chinese trade minister, yesterday uh, resulted in this request, really. Uh, China asking Australia to actively support China's ascension to that trade block. Now, this would be a, a minor shift from Australia's current position where it says it doesn't object to China joining the CPTPP. So this is where China's at at the moment, is courting all of the members of that trade block. Uh, there was also a meeting with New Zealand's trade minister on the sidelines as well. And unanimous support of all member countries is needed. Uh, China also urged Australia to address uh, the issues that Chinese businesses face in the country. It didn't really go into specifics. It was quite a short statement, but that is emblematic of the problems that this relationship continues to have. There are still some trade strikes in place against Australian exports. We talked about wine yesterday. They're expected to be gone soon, but mm. lobster, a handful of abattoirs as well. And then there's the issue of Yang Hengjun, the Australian academic who's facing a suspended death sentence in China at the moment as well on espionage charges. So still a few things to resolve. Uh, before Australia would actively support uh, China's ascension as it wishes. But there's other issues clouding this as well. And just for example, Taiwan's interested in joining the bloc. And uh, mm. that would make things more complex at the risk of understatement. And Paul, there's been such a big and protracted push for reform at the WTO, but it's sort of easier said than done. So what's the latest on that? Yeah, I think you captured the spirit, really. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk. Uh, that talk matching deeds is always the challenging part. Uh, we did hear from the Director General Ngozi Congo iwala in her opening remarks. Uh, she was talking about the need to repair the multilateral trading system. She called it strained. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a delegate that didn't think that was a fair description. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are always tensions here, right? Uh, India, for example, the Commerce Minister of India will arrive today. India wants legal certainty around subsidies. Other countries like Australia oppose the shielding of subsidies. So this underscores the difficulty of finding agreement among a bloc as large as this one. There are 164 members. Now, two more got welcomed as well. East Timor and Comoros have joined the WTO. So the body keeps growing, but finding goal alignment within that body very, very difficult. Uh, aside from that problem, uh, the Director General also talked about sluggish demand uh, globally, with the exception of the US and India, and also this uh, target for global growth of 3.3 percent. Well, the WTO set that before the Israel-Hamas war. Uh, so the Director General saying, well, look, that might be a little bit optimistic now. Paul Allen in Sydney there and uh, the UK Trade Minister Greg Han says the economy will feel the impact of slower global growth and the turmoil in the Red Sea. Han spoke to Bloomberg at the WTO ministerial meeting in Abu Dhabi. I think it always concerns us uh, when growth is undershooting uh, what people are forecasting and what, uh, what people want. Uh, higher growth need, means uh, greater prosperity, greater tax revenues for governments. You know, there's uh, strong reasons why we want global, global growth uh, to recover. Uh, we, that's why the UK, for example, is taking strong action in the Red Sea in concert with our allies uh, to make sure that trade continues to flow and that the world does not suffer unduly from events in the Middle East. You did mention that developing countries should benefit as much as richer nations and that this particular conference has been about that. What about the digital goods 
tariff moratorium. Yeah. Yeah. Does that get renewed for another two or more years? Well, this is essential um, for the World Trade Organization. I mean, this would be really going backwards for it not to be renewed. This would mean that there would suddenly be the potential for customs duties on anything from a, uh, a, a sharing a, a, sharing a um, Spotify through to uh, Netflix through to potentially anything that could be transmitted uh, digitally could be subject to customs duties. Now, we think this would be a really retrograde step to go back 20 years or more when there are customs duties on electronic transmissions. We think that it benefits the whole world and developing countries in particular to not have duties on digital transactions. Sure, nonetheless, some developing countries might see it as a chip to use in their favor if they could bargain with it, for example? Well, our own estimates are that uh, developing countries, uh, whatever they might gain from the tax revenues from this, would be dwarfed by the losses to GDP. Uh, so 20 to 30 times as much loss in GDP um, compared to what they might gain out of tax revenue. So it's strongly against the interests of developing countries. It's against the interests of everybody. Um, to put these customs duties on something which, which obviously people expect to flow pretty fleetly around the world. Well, can your delegation help convince everybody else? What are the odds that this doesn't get done? I mean, you have to convince Indonesia, India and possibly other countries to go well, along with it. I think we've got about 130 or 140 countries now have agreed that uh, to not put customs duties on e-commerce transactions or to, in this case, roll over the e-commerce moratorium. That's a pretty good position. I think the uh, large number of developing countries and, and some very large developing countries agree with us that it would not be a good way forward. Talk to us about the free trade agreement with India. Is it going to get signed before India goes to elections, likely late April? Well, look, we've always said that what is important is uh, the deal, not the date. What is important is what is going to be in the deal, and that negotiation is live at the moment. What are the sticking points preventing it from getting done and dusted? Well, look, there's a huge amount that you can do with India. There's, there's, uh, there's so much can be done on a trade agreement with India. It wouldn't be right for me to say where are the areas that are being more difficult, but uh, obviously uh, um, we are looking forward to getting something done. We're putting a lot of time and effort into it across the whole of the UK system uh, and on the Indian side as well. UK Trade Minister Greg Hans is speaking with Bloomberg's Bonnie Quinn. You can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Bloomberg subscribers can find it at Debut Go in their terminals. It's also available on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customise those settings as well so you just get the news on the industries and assets that matter to you. This is Bloomberg. Take a look at some of the stories that we're tracking. Uh, U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says advanced semiconductor companies have requested more than double the amount of available federal funds for projects in the U.S. She says leading edge firms, including Intel, TSMC and Samsung, are seeking more than $70 billion under the CHIPS Act. The 2022 law earmarked billions in grants and loans to bring chip making back to the U.S. The Indian government is evaluating $21 billion in proposals from foreign and local chip makers seeking taxpayer support. Sources say Israel's Tower Semiconductor is proposing a $9 billion plant, while homegrown Tata Group has put forward an $8 billion fabrication plan. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is pushing to turn India into a global chip making hub. Well, Heidi, we just had a Euro stocks futures coming online and uh, taking a look at the outlook here, it's Again, very range bound. Probably can't say that enough today for, for, for equities generally. It's, it's very, very muted here, but still, we have seen Euro stocks or European stocks falling from a record high, and it is just about that wait and see mode because investors really want to understand the outlook for inflation, specifically in the US. We get that Fed's preferred inflation gauge later this week, and that'll give us big clues into how fast the Fed is likely to shift away from its policy settings here. But that is the outlook for Euro stocks futures as they come online here. As I said, a little bit of weakness creeping through, but still very, very range bound.
Take a look at how we're tracking when it comes to the early part of the Tuesday session here in Asia. Not a lot of direction given that we did have uh, really U.S. stocks stalling in this rally just short of record highs. We do have uh, some gains when it comes to the Nikkei 225. Those inflation numbers come in hotter than expected. The CPI that is uh, a little bit of a head scratcher in terms of how that plays into what the BOJ does next given we did see the economy of course slipping into recession as well. Uh, we have seen sort of JGB future uh, looking like a downward buyer so far in the session with that heat headline and core CPI a bit above forecast. Uh, the cost be a little bit on the back foot there, about four tenths of one percent lower. We are seeing Australian stocks broadly being dragged lower by, in particular, the likes of the miners and some of the property and real estate names, uh, really the, the biggest losers in the Sydney session so far. Kiwi stocks uh, are off by about six tenths of a percent just ahead of that RBNZ decision that comes midweek. They are of course expected uh, to keep rates on hold but potentially put through a little bit of verbal jawboning of uh, the intent or the risk of more hikes still on the horizon. Uh, one of the stocks we're watching is Rakuten raise, uh, to raise their, their uh, we are seeing a loss of about 3.7% uh, in the session, one of the stocks that we are watching. Yeah, and Heidi, uh, another stock we're going to be watching as well is CLP here because we had that uh, company reporting its uh, earnings earlier. This is a Hong Kong-based power utility firm, and it, as I said, it reported a seven-fold profit jump over the course of 2023, but earnings did miss analyst estimates. The company also saw a turnaround in the fair value related to its forward energy contracts, mainly from its Energy Australia business. Joining us now to discuss all of this is its CEO, TK Chung. And uh, TK, we can get to the to the Energy Australia business in a moment because that is one of your wholly owned subsidiaries. Yep. But uh, at a headline level, as I said, it was a miss. So what were the key takeaways for you from the numbers? Yeah, for CLP in 2023, we have a uh, uh, very solid you know, uh, financial performance, mainly uh, uh, because of the dependable you know, business performance in our core markets in Hong Kong and in mainland China. But at the same time, you know, our you know, uh, businesses in other uh, places like Australia and, and India, they are also doing good. Um, you know, over the you know, past years, we have uh, excellent operational performance. Uh, for example, our safety performance, you know, injury rate reduced by, you know, more, uh, about uh, 30 percent. At the same time, we are also, you know, accelerating our investments in, you know, non-carbon, you know, projects. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, renewable projects. And, and in India, we are also investing in, you know, transmission and, you know, smart meter, you know, investment. Uh, at the same time, because of this accelerated, you know, investment in, in renewable energy, uh, so we are, you know, tightening up our, uh, you know, carbon intens intensity targets uh, by 2030. Uh, we have published our climate vision 2050, in which we will achieve, commit, you know, we commit to achieving, you know, carbon neutrality by 2050. But there are interim targets, and by 2030, our original carbon intensity target was uh, 0.3 kilogram per unit of electricity, and we are now reduced to 0.26. And it's kind of like a step forward, you know, the 1.5 degree, you know, target. Mm. It's, it's ambitious, I guess, but it's also very expensive. It's very costly. It, it's very competitive as well, the renewables landscape. So how do you see CLP faring in that sort of environment and, and in mainland China in particular? Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, um, you know, when we talk about you know energy transition, you know, affordability definitely is one of the key you know consideration. That's why we have to take a kind of like prudent approach when we set our target, our roadmap, you know, to carbon neutrality. We have to take into account the operating environment. Now, for example, in China, the pace of you know accelerating actually uh, the pace of decarbonisation actually is accelerating. Uh, there are you know, huge amount of renewable energy you know to be put in you know online you know to help the country to decarbonize and CLP want to uh, you know you know take the same ride you know in accelerating our decarbonization uh, strategy yeah how much of that budget plan of just shy of 53 billion Hong Kong for 2024 to 2028 how much of that will be spent on mm. the green transition 
Yeah. Now, for the uh, 52.9 billion Hong Kong dollars approved in the development plan, there are a few objectives. You know, the, you know, the object, one of the key objectives actually is to help Hong Kong to develop the economy, uh, including the increasing supply of housing. You know, in the coming few years. At the same time, we also want to upkeep our plan to to ensure that we have, you know, reliable power you know, supply of electricity to the to the customer. And if you can remember, actually last year we did have uh, some you know, adverse weather, including super typhoon and you know the um, uh, the black rainstorm. So we also want to make sure that our power system uh, stay resilient to those adverse weather conditions. And at the same time, we will continue decommunization, you know, uh, to help the government to achieve the targets. Um, can you share a bit more about your efforts to find a better partner for Energy Australia? Yeah. So in Australia, actually, you know, because for CLP, our you know core strategy is to focus on our core markets, you know, including Hong Kong and China, in this energy transition. But at the same time, we also want to maintain our diversified portfolio, so continue to invest in you know um, countries and regions outside our core market, including uh, Australia and India. Uh, and you know, because of the fact that you know the whole energy transition, we need a lot of capital. So uh, you know, in order to ensure that we can really help those markets to decarbonize, we are open to uh, you know uh, working with other partners. And for example, in India, we have successfully uh, introduced you know a uh, Canadian uh, investment fund, CDPQ, as our partner. So our Indian you know uh, subsidiary uh, joint venture, you know. Um, uh, private energy, it is now a 50-50 you know, joint venture. And in Australia, actually, we are open-minded about you know, the form of partnership, you know, be it maybe at the project level or at, at the enterprise level, uh, so, so we are open. And, but, it, but I think the, uh, the focus at the moment is really to uh, turn around the Australian business, so given the fact that in 2022, the, form, the performance was not satisfactory, and we want to you know, uh, turn around the business uh, to make sure that it's sustainable. You mentioned that energy makeup as well. Are you, are you sort of uh, considering offshore wind? Is that something that you still think is going to be good value, for instance, for the Hong Kong market? There's also LNG purchases to take into account. What's sort of the, the breakup between the different energy types? Mm. Yeah, in Hong Kong, I think we have a quite a clear roadmap for decarbonisation. Uh, the first phase is to reduce coal and increase gas. So basically, we are almost, you know, uh, you know, complete this uh, first phase because we have commissioned our first um, uh, uh, gas generation unit D1 and D2 is to be commissioned this year, and we have also commissioned our uh, offshore LNG terminal. So this first phase decarbonisation basically is is like almost complete. But then we now preparing for the second phase. Second phase is to import more zero carbon energy from mainland China to Hong Kong so that we can gradually uh, phase out coal generation. And for importing you know, zero carbon energy, it includes nuclear and renewables. So we, you may recall, you know, Dai Bay nuclear power, sh power station, we invested in the Dai Bay and then bring power to Hong Kong. Actually, this year is the 30th anniversary of importing nuclear power to Hong Kong. And it amounts to about, you know, 25% of the uh, electricity consumption for the whole Hong Kong. So going forward, we hope that we can import you know, nuclear and also renewable energy. Now, for renewable energy, definitely you know, it would include wind and, and, and solar, and offshore wind could be one of the uh, uh, possibilities that we will, we will try to explore. TK, I'm keen to get your views on the renewables market for India. Is there still going to be imports from China to install in India? And what's your guidance or forecast when it comes to the rate of installations for that market? Yeah. So in India, you know, because India itself, they uh, have a quite aggressive uh, decarbonisation target and they also want to be like self-sustained. So they are actually spending a, a lot of efforts in developing the uh, renewable energy manufacturing capability within India. 
And, and this is something actually we are also you know, uh, trying to explore because of the fact that that will help us reduce our costs you know, in, you know, and also competitiveness uh, in, in, the, in the business. And you know, more recently, actually, where in those projects that we have won, for example, you know, solar, uh, 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 you know, solar projects, we are now exploring actually using locally uh, uh, you know, assembled uh, you know, solar panels uh, in order to help reduce our costs. All right, TK, that was uh, TK Chung there, CEO at CLP. Thanks so much for your time this morning. And you can watch us live and see our past interviews on our interactive TV function, TV Go. There you can also dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions we talk about. Plus, become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. You're watching Daybreak Asia. Just taking a look at the moves that we're seeing this morning. Treasury yields just moving, moving a little bit lower here, but pretty much stationary at this point in time, really. Uh, we are just getting some lines that are dropping here around the outlook for the Fed and, and the expectations that we would see any sort of uh, Fed cuts on the horizon. But we're just hearing from the Fed Reserve Bank of Kansas City President uh, that Schmid saying the U.S. Central Bank should be patient in cutting rates uh, with inflation above its 2% target and the job market still strong. So just another pushback that we're hearing here from Fed officials that they're really not in any sort of rush to cut rates. But that is what we're hearing there, as I said, from the uh, another Fed official. Moving to today's big take here, because for more than two decades, the global stock market has been shrinking, not in terms of market value, of course, we've been tracking that huge rally. We've seen U.S. stocks at a record, but still in the number of companies that have gone public. In the U.S. alone, so-called de-equitization has shriveled the number of companies that are publicly listed by almost 75%. For more on that story, let's bring in our equities reporter, Bailey Lipschultz, here for us. And Bailey, thanks so much for joining us. I mean, I think the big question from this, are corporations going to be taking advantage of that, that shift? That's certainly the question. We've been seeing that play out in Europe and the UK. We've had Campari, Aston Market, Martin, Finair, and among the number of companies that have opted to sell shares as opposed to sell debt. It has taken place a few times here in New York, but it does seem like it is a trend that at least on the verge, if interest rates stay as elevated as they are and shares continue to rally, as you can see in that chart, it could be something that we see corporations at least start kicking the tires and taking seriously into consideration again for the first time in more than two decades that's been the case. Bailey, unfortunately, my earpiece actually just fell out there, uh, so I couldn't actually hear some of that response. But, but uh, I guess the question is, what would tempt more more uh, corporations to, to be listing then instead? Well, we would see the potential listing. So you're talking about IPOs. You're looking at companies that maybe funding is more difficult. So now they're opting to uh, kind of take advantage while they can on lower valuations to sell stock if they need to in order to go public. And that could draw in more companies that have been waiting in the wings for the last few years to actually go public and maybe edge back towards some of the levels that we've seen, you know, since 1996 when the number of publicly traded companies peaked. But the big question going forward will be where are interest rates trading at? What does that mean for corporations and debt? And how risk uh, tolerant are investors? If we continue to see major averages climbing, it does kind of bode well that we will see the likes of Reddit and a number of other companies that maybe aren't quite profitable yet considering going public, at least here in New York and likely around the world. We've seen two major sources of de-equitization, de uh, leveraged buyouts and buybacks already declining. So is there, are there sort of a, a, a slate of reasons why we could see this not take hold? The main thing would be kind of if the Fed and central bankers around the world opt to swiftly cut interest rates. So we've seen the tolls of higher interest rates impact those leveraged buyouts. We've seen private equity uh, being stuck with companies that they thought they would have been able to exit over the last two years while 
IPO markets and equity capital markets have been slow, kind of coming to roost. So the main thing would be uh, for corporations or for this reequitization, if you will, to not take place is if we do see interest rates, in fact, come back near levels that they were in 2020 and in, in 2021, and if there's another source of capital. So that's going to be the big thing, at least when it comes to companies potentially uh, not opting to sell equity as opposed to debt. But it does seem like when I talk to equity capital markets bankers, there still is a very much expectation in the next 3, 12, 16 months that we will see a number of IPOs and kind of a return to normal that we haven't had in the last two years. Bloomberg's equities reporter Bailey Lipschultz there and terminal subscribers can get more in today's piece in full at NI Big Take Go. Some of the corporate stories that we're following this hour, US regulators have faulted Boeing for ineffective procedures on a breakdown in communications between senior management and other staff members. A FAA panel also found what it calls a lack of awareness of Boeing's safety-related metrics among employees. The report comes after a mid-air fuselage blowout in January. We focus the spotlight on Boeing safety issues. Chinese carmaker BYD says it's been contacted by the Italian government to bring some of its auto production to the country. BYD's Europe managing director says the need for a second European plant depends on sales volume. Italy is looking to attract another auto manufacturer after Stellantis signaled it may move production to lower cost countries. Well, fashion, fast fashion company rather Shein is said to be considering listing in London instead of the U.S. Sources say the firm thinks it's unlikely that U.S. regulators would approve an offering there. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Asia IPO reporter Peg Lee. And Peg, I mean, great scoop that you got on this one. I'm, I'm, I'm curious because we were, we were discussing last hour with Chris still about the, the performance of, of Chinese companies that have chosen to list in the U.S., that could be actually perhaps even a bigger concern than the regulatory one of actually not being greenlit in the first place. Uh, what did you find out and, and what has been the performance of Chinese companies that have chosen to go public in London instead? Uh, I think for Xi'an, this one is really interesting because basically the company's Taking two battles, right? Like it's 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 both getting the trying to get the approval from the U.S. Security uh, the Se Security and Exchange Commission, but also for them to proceed with the overseas listing. Uh, apparently now they also have to get approval from the Chinese regulators. For the longest time, there was mm -hmm. this debate: oh, whether she would be considered as a Chinese company, and then have to go through this, right? Uh, Considering that the company doesn't really sell to China, has no revenue from China, and um, you know the management are based in China, I, I'm based overseas, and the and the, and the um, uh, this had even had a quarter in Singapore, right? So, uh, so they proceeded uh, with, uh, with that U.S. application uh, late last year. Apparently, uh, in their communication, they realized, oh, uh, seems like the politically, it's, it's, it's it seems quite likely that the U.S. regulators are going to grant them the green light to. To go ahead. So, what's the next? Right? I mean, politically speaking, it uh, seems to them, you know, uh, London is this is a second option. It's, it seems to it seems to be politically more friendly, but also it can still keep its distance from China, as you know, uh, pol politicians in the in the U.S. and also I guess in Europe, uh, some are really asking for more transparency about Xi, asking them about questioning about their China presence, questioning about their supply chain, and also the uh, forced, la uh, forced labor issues, among others. Yeah, you know, I can understand the U.S. as being the top choice. Obviously, the bulk of their sales go to that market. But if they're going to suffer these regulatory uh, scrutiny in Europe as well for the same reasons, does an Asian boss make more sense at Hong Kong or Singapore? Uh, it seems like now London is still the uh, the second option, as you know the company also has been trying really hard to. It seems to us, you know, they're trying to keep its distance from China. Uh, you know, if 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 it doesn't really work out in the if it doesn't really work out in London, I think that we understand the third option would be Singapore, because you know, still not China. I mean, uh, not China, China, but you know, um, kind of. And it also makes sense because it's where. It, it's headquartered, and also uh, they believe they might get the full support from you know the regulators, regulators over there. Bloomberg's Asia IPO reporter uh, Pei Li, there the latest on uh, potentially what we could see when it comes to the Xi'an IPO. More ahead on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg.
taking a look at how crypto prices are faring this morning, uh, again, not too much movement. So sort of in line with the broader market trend today, which is, is range bound. But still here, yeah, take a look at that level for Bitcoin because we're above the 54,000 mark and we haven't touched that in a couple of years here. So it has been that enthusiasm around ETFs, big, that spot Bitcoin ETFs, of course. But we have seen investors piling in and that's sort of underpinning the pricing that we're seeing. Uh, it is... Of course, as well, always that sort of jostling that we continue to track for, for dominancy of where is going to be the next crypto hub. And Hong Kong has really been on a mission to sort of cement its position, at least for the Asian region. But now we're hearing that they're planning a licensing regime that's going to force crypto OTC or over-the-counter providers to collect customer records and add staff to monitor for misconduct. So something that could really dent what has been a pretty key part of the industry. So let's get more on that now and bring in our Asia finance reporter Suva Shigosh here and Suva it, it's it's very curious really because we've seen Hong Kong really trying to, to ramp up enthusiasm for the sector but then at the same time you hear that they want to they want to have these curbs as well so what's the signal do you think Indeed, it is a bit of a confusing signal for somebody who's looking at it from the outside. But I would say, you know, this the signal is basically it's a clampdown, as you rightly said. And just to set a context to this, you know, uh, last year, the Hong Kong's uh, Securities and Futures Commission, the watchdog, had come out with a uh, regulation to uh, regulate the uh, crypto platforms which are unlicensed. Now, that that did not really include the over-the-counter platforms. And according to a chain analysis report, 60 out of the $64 billion that Hong Kong received last year in crypto, a majority of that belonged to from, or came from, uh, trading is from the OTC, ma OTC markets, you know. So that part is not yet regulated. And if you remember, uh, Annabelle, like last year we saw a big blow up in Hong Kong from, on the JPEX platform. And that also led to concerns that these, this, this kind of uh, alleged money laundering or cyber thefts are, uh, are coming out from the from the OTC uh, platforms which are not regulated yet. That's a big reason for you know Hong Kong to uh, try to plug this loophole. Of course, it is a clampdown. It is a very strong signal that Hong Kong is trying to give to the rest of the world that well we are opening up for crypto, but that doesn't mean that we are a breeding ground for any kind of you know uh, hanky panky or, uh, or or money laundering or uh, or this kind of you know thefts that we typically see. In, in the crypto world. Our Asia finance reporter, Suvashri Ghosh, there with the latest on Bitcoin. This is the picture across futures. Of course, we had when it comes to the US session, not much of a lead, really slumping kind of uh, close to those record highs. US futures looking a little bit softer at the moment. Watching China as well, we've seen uh, Chinese equities losing some momentum over the past few days after we'd see that hopeful rebound from five year lows earlier this month. We could also see investors continuing to take a breather, right, uh, in terms of some of these more meddlesome government policies. This is Bloomberg.